Hello, Tom Lebrecki here with the latest edition of the New Theory Podcast. So now I reached out to my guest, Benita Alexander, after seeing he lied about everything. And guys and gals, this story is something else. Benita, welcome to the New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. All right. So before we get into the crust of the documentary, um, yeah. give us your backstory. You were accomplished in media. You had a whole life you know, prior to this. Give us a little backstory and tell us who you are, who you were. Um, I've been a journalist for many years. I graduated with a degree in print. Um, always thought I would go into print, but ended up gravitating towards radio and television. Um, worked in local television, behind the scenes, on camera in Michigan. Okay. And then came to New York to work for um, NBC and cool. spent 17 years there producing everything from investigative um, stories to I worked with all the big talent at NBC so had a very successful career. Nice so so you're in media kind of rocking and rolling and uh, you, you were married and, and you have a beautiful daughter correct? I do yes. Okay so then unfortunately you, you lost your husband at the time. Yeah we had divorced in um, 2009 and to very sadly 2011 he was diagnosed with brain cancer uh, glioblastoma which is the same one that McCain had, it's awful. The yeah, it's a, yeah. is, is really grim. No, they say most people don't make it past two years and no. he, he died a little less than two years later. Really tragic. So, sorry to hear that. And I, I used you. to work in pharmaceuticals and we made a drug called Temidar, which helped with one of those, I think that particular one, a few other yeah. cancers. And the side effects of just the drug itself is almost as bad I know. as the illness, but you're fighting for days. So so my, my and our condolences, uh, there. So then, so then obviously, you know, so then you were divorced before, but it's still painful to your daughter's father. Uh, so then you're a single mother at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you know, you meet a particular <laughs> individual, but I don't want to, I don't, you know, let one, I kind of let you, you know, Dr. Paolo. So, you know, how did you meet him and, and uh, give us a little bit, and let's assume people didn't see the documentary. So, okay. to see it. so let's give them enough, but definitely, you know, give us a backstory how you met Dr. Paolo. So I was assigned to work on a documentary about something called regenerative medicine, which is this very exciting field in medicine, which is kind of like science fiction, Frankenstein kind of stuff, yeah. where, where the idea is that eventually we would build new organs and body parts in the lab. You know, you basically, correct. something happens to you, you get sick, you get in an accident, you just go get a new body part from the lab. Correct, correct. So very exciting field, a lot of potential, a lot of promise, a lot of hope. And I was assigned to work on a story about it. And we were following the case of this um, young Korean toddler who was going to be the, the youngest person in the world to get an artificial uh, windpipe or trachea um, that was being made by this doctor who was uh, nicknamed the super surgeon. And he was world renowned, world famous, worked at the place that gives the Nobel Prize in medicine. Yeah. And so we started following this case and this doctor and, um, this is how I met this man. Wow. So, so you, you know, being an investigative journalist, I'm assuming that, and he was him being the subject of the piece, you probably did some like precursor, you know, precursor background in terms of who he was, what he did and that kind of stuff. So when you initially researched him, was it more like, Hey, this guy's great. I'm really excited to meet him. Or did it pique your interest? Like, wow, wow. I hope he's single. You know, how did, how did that kind of No, happen? yeah, no, initially not at all. I mean, yeah. I definitely was, as everybody was, kind of yeah. in awe of him. I mean, yeah. he was nicknamed the super surgeon. He had this reputation for being, he was kind of a rebel. He was kind of a cowboy. Yeah. He, was, he was the guy that was pushing through barriers and pushing through medical frontiers and was willing to take the risks that nobody else was willing to take. And we need those people in medicine. You need people like that, right. you know, as you know, who are going to push medicine forward. And so... I was intrigued by that, but I certainly did not imagine that this was someone that was going to become part of my life. So you meet, is it, you know, and, and it's like, hey, like, you, it's rap, you know, hey, let's grab a cocktail or a rap party or just usual, hey, let's, let's email back and forth some post-production notes. Like, how, how did the, the personal relationship evolve at, at that point? First, we were talking on the phone a couple of times and by email, all very professional. And then the first time that we interviewed him, he was in um, Boston um, well. speak, speaking at a conference and we went to do our first interview with him. And it was the craziest thing. And he came around the corner, I was sitting with a colleague in a restaurant waiting. And the second he came around, I've never, literally never had anything like this happen to me in my life. Our yeah. eyes locked 
and something just happened. I mean, I felt like this chill go up and down my body. I had kind of, it was kind of a spark and I had butterflies and I thought, what the hell was that, you know? Um, and I also thought, whatever that was, let it go, ignore it. Um, <laughs> because um, it was, it was, I, you know, it was the professional versus, I'm like, what is happening here? But um, yeah, there was some kind of instant connection, you know, and he's got this, he's very charming. He's very, well, very charming. And in, in, in fairness to him, one, he's not hard on the eyes. And, and no, he's not. We'll yeah. Um, number two, he's Italian, and I'm, I'm Italian, so I know how, like, <laughs> even even sometimes I get, like, snookered by Italian, just as je ne sais quoi, if you will, I'm using a, a French term, but just the way they are, are, you know, very different, different than, you know, Americans, very, like, almost such a feel, uh, feeling very open to, like, you know, when you meet Italians, it's like, wow, they're really, like, in tune with their emotions, which we're not used to as Americans. Yeah. Um, so I see that, and he's a surgeon, which, which doesn't hurt. Um, no. So, so my, okay, so you, you meet, you lock eyes, you, oh, sorry, sorry, went on, that's your head, sorry. So you, you lock eyes, you have, you know, connection. Was it, was it mutual? Like, did you guys kind of like, you know, have an affinity for I would, I would find out later that it was, he, he would tell my friend, I didn't know that at the time. He told my friends later that he was instantly intrigued by me and, um, I, but I didn't know that until months later. We kept it very professional. And then what happened is this toddler was being operated on in Illinois. And so I was going back and forth to Illinois for her surgery. And at the time, my ex-husband was approaching the end and things were just grim and difficult. And I was at a really, in hindsight, a really, really vulnerable point. I mean, my, I, was, I knew my ex-husband was about to die. I knew my then nine-year-old daughter was about you know, to lose her dad. And she was very much daddy's little girl. And it was on me to tell her somehow that her dad was going to die. I didn't know how to do that. And I didn't even know how to prepare myself for what was coming. And he initially seemed just like a very good friend. We would, at the end of shoot days, we would talk, we would go to dinner together. He's a really good listener. Um, and I kind of poured my heart out to him and he was a great friend. And I thought at the time, this really caring person that had taken this great interest in this little girl that he'd never met, and um, had really wise, sage advice. I mean, this was someone, you know, he's a surgeon. He's dealt with people dying all the time. And he gave me wonderful advice on what to tell her, when to tell her, how to tell her. So initially, I, he was just, we were friends. And um, I thought he was a pretty incredible human being, actually. You know, a really caring, altruistic person who actually cared about humanity. Wow, and then okay, so then as it as it evolved, let's say romantically, uh, what was the logistics? You were in New York, he was in Sweden or Italy. Like, where where was he? Where were you? How did you date? Had it weekends every the weekends? How, how did that all work? So we we after a little while became um, romantically involved. I sort of fell head over heels for him, and he was working all over the world. Um, I'm based in New York, um, but he spent a lot of time in New York too. So. I would see him at least at least twice a month and we wow. we took trips all over the place he flew me everywhere it was very romantic it was completely being swept off my feet i mean it was like prince charming walked in which probably should have been my first sign because there is no such thing as prince charming um but it felt like it i was walking on clouds he was incredibly generous and and he literally was dream man he just seemed like dream man he checked off every box you could ever want there was nothing wrong so, and for those listening and those heard about your background, like you, like knowing you a little bit or knowing your background, it was probably hard for you to be awestruck because you're probably around celebrities, you know, at, at Rockefeller Center every day. So it was almost yeah. like, you know, it's almost like, oh, great. But, you know, he actually, you know, went the distance to, hey, let me fly you here or hey, I'm in New York, let's get together. So relationship, you know, we're all adults, relationships form. You guys get serious. And then he pops the question, you know, where did he do it and how did he do it? That was actually very sweet and very, he, tend, he tended to do everything very over the top. Um, he was always surprising me. I mean, we'd go on trips and I'd walk in and the bed was covered in rose petals. And, you know, there's a, oh, wow. a heart in rose petals on the bed to the point that every hotel we went to, the staff would pull me aside, like the women at the front desk or the, 
you know, where'd you meet him? How can, does he have a brother? You know, <laughs> how do I get one of those? <laughs> um, and all, it, it almost got to be too much, actually. And my friends would be like hanging on the edge of their seats waiting for me to come home from a trip. What did he do now? What did he do now? But his proposal was, it was our first Christmas together. Uh, it was quiet. It was just me, um, Paolo, and my daughter. We were at home and I was sitting on the couch and he handed me a box, which I didn't think anything of. And I opened it and it was this gorgeous ring. Wow. Um, and I was speechless, actually, because I wasn't expecting it at all. And um, it was really touching. It was very sweet. Um, felt very genuine. And I was elated. I was just elated. I was so happy. I thought he just seemed to be everything, you know, and he was really good with my daughter and she really liked him. And, you know, not that anyone could ever fill her dad's shoes, but he certainly seemed like somebody that could step into that role um, and do it very well. Yeah. Cause you know, this, like when you date as a parent, it's not just like, like, Hey, do I like you or do you like me? It's, you know, are they going to get along with my daughter? Like exactly. I'm introduced and what's the dynamic. And then when you break up, it's almost like, this, but it's almost like two breakups, right? It's true. You know, it's true. Yeah. Feelings. Very true, um, yeah. As well as yours. So, so, but you guys got set the date. If I if I remember correctly, um, in the documentary, you were scheduled to get married in July. Was it the following year, or was it two years? We got ago? engaged December of twenty thirteen, and then we the wedding was set for ju July eleventh, twenty fifteen. Okay, so one of the reasons there was a delay is because when I met him, I knew that he was um, separated from his wife. Okay. He had he had an Italian wife that he'd been married to for many years. He said they were separated and that they, and he had a house in Barcelona, which I knew he did. And she lived in Italy and they'd, they'd just never gotten divorced because of the kids. And they had two kids who were, you know, late teens. A little minor detail. <laughs> yeah. But he, then he said, you know, when he, he claimed when he met me, now he had met the woman that changed his life and he wanted to get, he finally wanted to get divorced and he filed for divorce. And it was August of 2014 when he told me the divorce went through. And after that, we began planning the wedding. Well, for the record, in Italy, nothing goes that quick, especially divorces. But yeah. it's plausible. It sounds plausible. You know, we're reasonable people, right? To that point, it sounds plausible. So you got the mm -hmm. ring. Hey, you're divorced officially. You know, you, you, you just need to have them unencumbered, right? Yeah. So, so you set the date for the following year. Mm -hmm. And this is the part where, like, the documentary for me goes from, like, zero to 100. Like, all, like... As crazy as it sounds, all reasonable things, right? I'm, I live in New Jersey. I'm in New York a lot. It's not, you meet a lot of outliers, right? So this, yeah. to me, you're both outliers, right? You're both going to be in those circles. So you're all going to meet, going to fall in love. Take it as a compliment. Both very attractive people. Like all, all makes sense to me at this point, actually. Where it gets a little crazy is yes, what Pope, happens next. The yeah. Pope himself is supposed I to. I know. Guys. I know it sounds, I mean, on the surface, like it sounds right. insane. And right. I understand actually when people, if you just read that, that, you know, she thought the Pope was marrying him. I understand why people go, Oh, come on. Really? No, no, I'm um, not faulting you because he was such a badass. Right. Like, it's almost like, you know, it's probably not true, but like if somebody's going to pull it off, it's going to be. Right. You know? But it, the setup was, so he, he insisted on having a Catholic wedding. He's Catholic. And he was very insistent on getting married in Italy he wanted to get married in, in Tuscany near where his mother lives. And he wanted this Catholic wedding. And from the beginning, I said, look, I'm not even Catholic, first of all. And what Catholic church is going to marry two divorcees? I well, that's, I, that's, that's, that, you know, that's I thought he was divorced. Yeah, but I know some churches, if you, but, but, I, but, I, but at this point, still reasonable. All right, keep going. Right. So it was this buildup because then he said, well, I'm going to go and talk to different. And he supposedly spent, you know, at least a week. He was on the phone with me every day, sending me pictures of different, you know, churches and everything and he kept saying he couldn't find a priest that he liked that would do it so then he told me he was going to call in a favor to the vatican um and he had told but he had told me um and a lot of other people and i'd even seen it on um a recommendation letter that he had um done work for the vatican which made sense because he was one of italy's top thoracic cardiothoracic surgeons and he said he was a consulting doctor to the pope which didn't sound that absurd. I mean, somebody has to do that job, right? right. Um, and I had seen it in a letter, you know, another doctor talking about how he'd done work for the Pope. So he claimed he was going to go to the Vatican and ask some people at the Vatican if they could help us find a priest that would be willing to marry us. And that's when things got nuts because he called me. He went, he goes to this meeting and 
before he went, I said, who are you meeting with? And he said, Pope Francis. I'm like, come on, really? Um, and he comes out of this meeting and he calls me and he said, you know, I had this great meeting, great news. The Pope wants to help us. He's going to help us find um, somebody who will marry us. But, and I, you know, but what? And he said, but um, you need to sit down. You're not going to believe this. The Pope wants to marry us himself. Um, and I called BS on him. I said, oh, come on, you know, like, give me a break. The Pope doesn't marry people. Like, um, and I actually hung up on him. I got so annoyed with him. I thought he was just playing a joke on me. But then I Googled it and the Pope had actually just married about 20 couples at the Vatican, including couples that are, were quote unquote living in sin. Um, so I thought, okay, maybe this isn't so ridiculous. And his story was that the Pope wanted to marry us because I mean, this is a very progressive, forward-thinking Pope, as we know, who was breaking all kinds of barriers. Correct. And that he saw us as kind of the perfect poster couple to push this forward-thinking agenda, you know, forward, and that he was going to marry, use us as a, an example to marry two divorcees. So it didn't sound, it's not as crazy as it sounds initially. And then it was, he was very clever because it was cloaked in the utmost secrecy, right? If the Pope marrying two divorcees would be so controversial, and so, I mean, it, this would make worldwide news. This is yep. huge. So everything had to be kept under wraps. Everything, I was sworn to secrecy. Everybody that we talked to was sworn to secrecy. And it was this big clandestine secret thing. I mean, I even had people sign non-disclosure non -disclosure agreements. Um, so that was, in hindsight, the perfect setup. Um, and really, then my life was really just- Really quick, really quick though, Benita, because that's interesting because as you know, and you probably did a ton of research afterwards, um, is a con person needs to make something believable and give something that's almost like a stretch, but then almost like says, okay, we have to keep this as an NDA because he can't be out public until it happens. And exactly. as crazy as it sounds, like I'm still subscribed now. I'm still like, hey, what, yeah, what am I getting my invite? I'm flying out to Alpha. <laughs> So, okay, so, so then, then, then you started like doing invites and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, yeah, know. and so people knew that it was a big wedding. Only people very closest to me knew that it was a, the Pope. They, what most people knew was that a lot of celebrities were coming and a lot of world leaders, which also made sense given the work he did. He worked in yeah. Sweden at the place that gives a Nobel Prize in medicine. He was doing a clinical trial in Russia and he was connected to all these, you know, big, world leaders and dignitaries supposedly and and people at the top of their profession in you know both the medical and scientific arena so it was turning into this big glamorous like wedding of the century now and that, and that's where i found interesting that in the day of social media and he and straight struck me as a guy who was running around doing selfies but but in the day of social media in the day of kind of you know full little more transparency like would he have pictures of him and andrea bocelli would he have pictures with him and these celebrities that were Bill Clinton, et cetera, was supposed to be on the list or was it more lip service afterwards? Uh, it, was, it was mostly stories and lip service. And it's funny you said that because I asked him a number of times if he had pictures and he, he, these guys are so good. He just always had the perfect, perfect excuse, you know, and everything sounded plausible. Anytime I would question anything and I, know, I didn't have any major doubts until the end, but anytime something seemed a little bit off and I questioned it, he was like, bam, you know, he had the answer right away. Um, so I always know what to say. So brings you to, okay, so we're, we're looking for a July 15 target date. What is the first incident or the first, was it a twinge, something you found? What was the first discrepancy? Pink flag, red flag, what was it and what happened? There were probably a few little pink slash red flags before that I kind of ignored. Um, I think we just do. I, I was in a love haze and I didn't, I didn't want to see it. Nothing really, really overt. Um, I mean, he was having some trouble um, professionally. He had been accused of scientific misconduct in Sweden. Um, that was the first big thing. That was about six months before the wedding and it was in the New York Times and that's how I found out about it. I had to read about oh, it in wow. the New York Times and I was really angry. Um, and, I, you know, I sort of said to him, why didn't, why didn't you tell me what was going on? His explanation for that was that he is this radical pioneer and that people wanted to take him down. People were jealous. And that when you're at the forefront of anything and you're, you know, the rebel pushing through barriers, people do get jealous and which actually makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. 
and that this was all just, he was being unfairly maligned. And I believed him, you know, I supported him. I did what any loving partner would do and I tried to help him through it. Um, but that changed the dynamic of our relationship. Um, and then there were little things I kept, he, he had told me that he wanted, which is again, the perfect setup. He wanted to surprise me with everything at the wedding. All I was supposed to do was buy my dresses and show up basically. Um, and he was doing all the planning and this was a point of contention at the beginning because I'm, I mean, I'm a producer, I'm somewhat of a control <laughs> freak and a woman. I, I mean, I wanted to plan my own wedding, but all my friends said, you know, look, this man has amazing taste. He's always surprising you for once in your life, Benita, like sit back and let someone just take over. Um, and it was a struggle for me at the beginning, but I did. And again, that was a perfect setup. So anytime I would have normally asked questions, I kept telling myself, okay, he wants to surprise you. Don't ask any questions. And he would, he would tell me enough, but not go into detail. But towards the end, I kept asking if I could talk to the wedding planner. Um, and he just, you know, it was one excuse after the other. And I thought that was odd. Um, and then there were some other little things, but nothing, nothing major. Interesting. And then I had, I mean, this was a killer. I quit my job, I, you know, after 17 years at this network television job, I quit my job. I pulled my daughter out of her private school where she'd been since kindergarten, um, very difficult school to get into, especially in New York. Yeah. And I was preparing to ride off into the sunset with him. I thought we were, the plan was that we were going to go and live at his house in Barcelona. He sat in front of my daughter and talked about the school he had enrolled her in in Barcelona and described all these things about her life in Barcelona. I mean, so much was at stake. I was basically giving up everything for this man, something I never thought I would do. And we were, I think it was eight weeks out from the wedding. It was, um, yeah, it was May 13th, exactly. The day after I left NBC, NBC my last day at work. Um, I went to the spa with a group of girlfriends. I was a little, I was struggling a little bit. I mean, I just left this um, very prestigious career and it was a big move. And I came out of the spa and I had an email from a colleague that simply said the subject line was the Pope. And in this email, it said that Pope Francis was, was not going to be in Italy on July 11th. Um, he was going to be in South America. Yes. And that this was a trip that had been planned for quite some time. And in that instant, I'd, I mean, I'd, it would take me months to fully understand and comprehend what was going on. But in that instant, I knew. I just, I almost literally fell on the ground. I felt sick. I just felt like someone had punched me in the stomach. Somehow, whatever little red flags had been nagging at me that I had been trying to suppress, in that instant, I just, I just knew. It was like an avalanche. So was your strategy to confront him uh, or catch him? Like, so I know, uh, and I have some questions about the Barcelona trip, uh, but before we get there, uh, what was your strategy at that point? Initially, so initially when I confronted him about it, obviously he, he you know, I, I said to him, is this all a lie? What's going on? And he had all, as he always did, one excuse after the other. And his excuse without getting into too much detail was that the Pope had been undermined by Pope Benedict, the, uh, the li other living Pope, who was very, very conservative, conservative, and that he did not want Francis doing something so controversial as marrying two divorcees, which again, makes sense. And that Benedict had gone behind his back to make, make it so that the Pope could not do this, that this could not happen. And he had basically sent him to South America. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Paolo promised he was going to fix it and he was rushing to Rome. He was getting on a plane, rushing to Rome. He was going to take care of everything. I didn't, I didn't believe him at all at that point, but I decided to kind of play a cat and mouse game with him because I knew he was lying. I had no idea the extent to which he was lying, but until I got all the information I wanted, I didn't want him to catch on that I was onto him. So, I mean, it was sort of like in a second, I woke up out of this dreamy love haze and put my journalist hat back on and went into investigative mode. And um, I mean, it, it was rough for a couple months. I had to keep telling him by phone that I loved him and um, you know, while I'm investigating him. And I hired two private investigators, one here and one in Italy, and then started my own investigating and canceled the wedding. Um, I canceled the wedding, which wow. is important because I'm not sure aside from I don't know what would have happened if I didn't cancel my wedding. Wow. Aside from the obvious, and we'll get, again, I want to talk a little bit about the Barcelona trip in a second, but what was the most shocking item 
and there was a lot of them. But the most shocking item that, and if you get a stateside investigator, Italy investigator, so out of those two investigations, what was the most shocking thing that was unearthed? That even for this crazy story, you were like, holy shit. Like what was like the biggest bombshell of, of what you found out during those investigations? I know there's a lot. So just... I mean, it was just everything. The whole yeah. thing was a lie. Literally everything was a lie. This wedding was never going to happen. It was all some sick fantasy he had played in his head. You know, all these things that he said were booked, you know, the everything, the the caterer, the, the castle where he told, he sat in, in front of all my friends and my family and told them he had rented this castle for everybody to stay in. People had bought plane tickets. I mean, he took this thing so far. People had booked hotels. People had purchased fancy, you know, black tie, red carpet gowns because they thought they were going, there. it was a whole weekend of events. And, um, you know, I mean, we we're six weeks out from the wedding and none of it was real. None oh, of it was yeah, real. Six weeks before, I thought it was earlier for some reason. Wow. You know? And so it was six weeks before when I canceled the wedding. Oh, um, still, yeah, still. But n nothing about the wedding was real. And then he was still married. He never got divorced. So he never could have legally married me in the first place. Wow. Um, so those were the two initial big killers that just, the whole thing was a lie. Um, and then he never could have married me in the first place. He was playing some kind of game with me. And then what I found in Europe when I went myself. Yeah, tell us about the Barcelona trip, because I think that's like the apex of, of the documentary. I mean, the documentary, you guys, guys got to say, we'll put a link, but I think that was the apex. So walk us through that trip. And I just got to ask, the biggest question is, why didn't you go to the door? So let, let's go through the, what happened. And I was just wondering why you didn't confront them. It's just that was my only question I wanted to ask you. So on what was supposed to be my wedding day, July 11th, I flew to Italy. Um, it was your wedding yeah. day? Yeah. yeah. Um, by myself, I got on this plane by myself, had a glass of champagne and um, I, because a lot of people, um, everybody had bought plane tickets. So a lot of my friends decided to still go to Italy to make a trip out of it. I mean, at least I wasn't sending them to you know, <laughs> Iowa or something. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I asked a group of my girlfriends if they would meet me and I said I wanted to do my own investigating. Partly I wanted to go, it was partly a girl's trip and yeah. partly it was to I wanted to see all the places I was supposed to go and this fantasy I was supposed to live out. And I wanted to see for myself. And I, my investigators had found out some information. It's very difficult to get into court records in Italy. Um, like it took the Italian investigator a while to find out that he was still married. Yeah. And I just knew because he had flown me all over the world, all these beautiful trips, you know, Greece, Bahamas, Russia, I, wow. all so many places. He never took me to the house in Barcelona and he always had an excuse. Every single time I was supposed to go to Barcelona, there was an emergency surgery. And we had actually argued about that a lot in the last three months before the wedding. Cause I kept saying, who the hell marries a man without seeing the house where they're going to live? This makes no sense. What about um, furniture? What's going on? What's a mailing address? What's going on? Yeah. Right. So I knew he was hiding something in that house. I just knew he was. I didn't know what it was, but I, I knew he was hiding something. And I knew the only way I was going to find out what it was, was to go there and to go there when he didn't know I was going there. So I, we were still talk communicating at that point. Um, I had canceled the wedding under the guise that the, the scientific investigation, misconduct investigation was getting out of hand, which it was. And he was too stressed and let's just postpone the wedding. So it was kind of the perfect excuse. And I told him on our wedding day, I actually lied to him. And I told him I had gone upstate New York with some girlfriends because I, you know, I was upset. I couldn't handle the wedding day. So he had no idea I was in Europe. I went with two girlfriends, two of my best friends um, to Barcelona. The first killer was the address that he had given me for the house, which I had given two people to mail us wedding gifts was a bogus address, um, didn't exist. So that was my first clue. So I find the right address. So he doesn't even know I have the right address. And we go to this house and I, because I wasn't sure what I was going to find, I put this hideous blonde wig on um, <laughs> just because I wanted to disguise myself in case I didn't know what I was gonna find there. I fully expected to find another woman there. Um, I, and we even had pictures on all of our phones of, of his wife and a couple other women that I suspect he was having affairs with. I was prepared for that. Um, and he was lying. He told me by text that morning that he was in Russia. So he's in theory in Russia. He doesn't know I'm coming to the house. 
we go to the house. When we first got to the house, he lives at the top of this hill in the seaside community in Barcelona. I stayed in the car because I wanted my friends to see what was going on first. And I was videotaping on my cell phone. And the first thing was they go to the door and I see him come down the stairs. So right away I lose it in the car and I'm swearing up a storm um, because he had told me he was in Russia and he's not in Russia, he's, he's there. And I can't hear what they're saying, but I can see this conversation happening. Doesn't last very long. And they handed him a gift, a, a bottle of wine. This is the plan we came up with that whoever answered the door that they were going to say, which was true. They had just come to Italy because um, they had tickets for this wedding and they wanted to leave a gift for this you know, wedding that never happened. So I see him take the bag and I see them walking back up the hill. And as they're walking back up the hill and I'm screaming and swearing, he takes the wine they just gave him and throws it in the garbage can across the street um, and then goes inside. But before that, and the reason I didn't go to the house is as I'm up top of this hill videotaping, watching and screaming and crying, I see two little kids run across the porch and then a woman and it was the kids i yeah. expected to see a woman i did not expect to see children and they were young kids and they were happily playing in the pool and yelling at him calling him dad and it just froze me i never it, he had a whole another family in this house and this is not his italian wife so in this yeah, house that's, where, that's what i was like kind of it wasn't even her it was like no, another, like, this is another family yeah. altogether and I would find out later that there was another family as well. So yeah. in addition to me, he had at least three others, other families. Wow, okay. So that's, that's why I didn't go to the house. Up until I saw the kids, I was getting ready to get out of the car and walk down the hill and confront him. Once I saw those kids, I couldn't. I mean, and we were, we're all moms and you know, those are innocent kids that have, my beef is with him, it's not with that woman, not with those kids. And I just, I just couldn't do it. So what happened next? Uh, I broke down completely in the car, which you see in the film. I just, at that point, I'd had moments where I had cried, I had broken down, but at that moment, it just all hit me and I, I just lost it. I'm just wailing in the car. I'm just, I'm just wailing. And it's, I mean, it's hard for me to even listen to now. Um, and my friends got, wanted to get me out of there to calm me down. And we went to a restaurant and I decided to text him. And I basically wrote this long text about this long, telling him that I know everything, I know he's lying about everything, calling him despicable and everything else. And I can't believe he did this. I can't believe he did this to my daughter. You're a horrible human being. He writes back one word. Wow. He writes back, wow. Okay. Remember that. That's literally all he said, wow. Like, wow, I've been caught. You know, what's, you know what's interesting about people like that? Like they're dead to rights, right? You got it. Yep. And you almost expect a rational response. Like, sorry. Yes. I've told you. They continue to like. Oh yeah. Act wrong. Like they did nothing like, wrong. And then, then that, and that just makes you a fucking nut. Like then, that, like you, like it's so like it is blow like like not that not that you were okay, but like okay, hey, got you. And then she'd be like, hey, okay. You got me, right? No, like, wow. And then now you're like really pissed because you're like, now you're not even sorry. So, so, and then he was, so he was dealing with a lot of stuff. You, you had a, you know, final get, finally get that, uh, what this, what the truth was. Did you, have you ever spoke to him since? So, um, it, that was obviously 2015. That was right just days after we were supposed to get married. And then, in 2018, I made this film for Discovery called, which aired on Valentine's Day, premiered on Valentine's Day of 2018, called He Lied About Everything. And in the making of that film, I tried to find him. Um, I traveled to Sweden and Russia. And, Russia, yeah, I remember that hotel. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. Some other places. And I, when I couldn't find him, I called him for the film. And to, to my surprise, he picked up, um, it was a very interesting conversation. It wasn't long. Um, and I had to tell him that I was recording him, so it didn't last long because of that. But initially when I called, it was the weirdest thing. So this was, I guess, 2017 when I made the phone call. So it had been two years. And 
he, he immediately, he has this very sort of soft, soothing voice as part of the charm. And he immediately went into this voice and I think he thought I was calling to reconcile. It was nuts because I could immediately feel him. How are you? You know, and, and I, ugh, it was sickening. And then, you know, I can't remember exactly what I said to him. And he said, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. And I said, what are you sorry for? You know, for, for lying to me about everything, for creating a fake wedding, you know, for lying to my friends, my family, for you know, upending my life, my daughter's life. Yeah. I'm sorry. He just said, I'm sorry. And it was like, it was a robotic, hollow, empty apology. It wasn't a real apology. I think he knew in his head, okay, I'm supposed to say I'm sorry. So I'm going to say I'm sorry. And that's all he said. So consistent with his dishonest ways, um, it appears that he was also uncovered in the medical community yeah. Or some behavior that was just not so great. Um, sorry. What, um, t walk us through that a little bit too. I think that's a big. Well, I mean, when I came home from, from Europe and I had found this other family in this house where I thought I was living happily ever after, trust me, I wanted to crawl under the bed and stay there. Um, it was embarrassing. It was humiliating. It was painful as hell. I mean, I'm an investigative journalist. I'm the last person on the planet that's supposed to get conned. And I just got conned. And all my friends and family were caught up in this. My daughter, I mean, it was horrible. And my heart was broken and so much was at stake. I'd given up everything. So now I'm the single mom with no job, no income coming in. My whole life has been torn apart and I wanted to fall apart, but I couldn't. I couldn't because I have a daughter who needed me. And I also, I had no evidence of, of it at the time, but I thought if he's lying to me this outrageously, you know, saying he knows all these celebrities and the Pope is marrying us and all this nonsense, yeah. he must be lying in his medical and professional life. And this is a man who has people's lives in his hands. Yeah. You know, this is a doctor. That means people's lives could be at risk. That means people could die. And that was terrifying and, and so horrifying to me that I thought, I have to do something about this. I felt an obligation to do something about it. I, th I thought at the time I might be the only person that had the information or had the guts to stand up and expose him. And I just thought this man needs to be exposed. This is, this is frightening. Yeah. And so that's the reason I decided to go public, um, which wasn't easy. Going public is no picnic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, it opens you up to all kinds of nasty haters and comments and people who want to make snap judgments without knowing the whole story. And, I had to air my whole, you know, it's like unzipping myself and just, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was hard. Um, but what, as when, when I first went public, which was first a magazine article in the beginning of um, 2016, before I made my film, at the same time, the scathing documentary came out in Sweden. They had been following him for a while and studying, investigating his medical work. And the two things happened at the same time. And oh. then it was just a, a, everything felt like a house of cards. Basically, bottom line is this artificial trachea that he had been putting into people didn't work. He, it seems like he knew it didn't work. He never did the scientific ex experiments that you're supposed to do before you do an experimental procedure on a human being. He basically used his patients as human guinea pigs. There were eight people worldwide that got this artificial, this groundbreaking revolutionary artificial trachea. Eight people, seven of them are dead. The only one that's still alive had the thing taken out. It doesn't work. Wow. So he was, um, and there are all kinds of investigations. He was fired um, from, from Karolinska where they give the Nobel Prize in medicine. Yeah. People on the Nobel Prize committee stepped down yeah. in shame. I mean, he fooled so many people, some wow. of the world's top doctors and scientists. And he's now facing, it's taken a little while, but he's facing um, charges of aggravated assault in Sweden in connection with the deaths of three of his patients. Well, so I, to be candid, I would, you know, like when you see these documentaries, you always kind of want evil to lose. I mean, we're all good people. Right? Yeah. And it was a little unfulfilling because what I gathered from it is you got some charges and then I went, yeah, of course, going to Wikipedia, et cetera. And like, I think he was like, got a short sentence and he's out or like, where is he now? Because I got that. That's part of the one I have the how does it resolve? Initially, Sweden um, looked into it and this was in my film and they, drop the charges, um, which is so disappointing. Yeah. Although it is complicated because these are experimental procedures. Yeah. So it's very difficult to prove that somebody did something intentionally or that they knew the patient was going to die. And he hid behind that. 
Yeah. These are yeah. these are very sick patients who were going to die anyway, is his excuse. And it's very difficult to prove that he knew that this thing wasn't going to work. What you can prove, however, is that he didn't do the scientific experiments, which is, like I said, using humans as guinea sure. pigs, which you can't, is unacceptable and sure. so egregious. Um, but so, and Sweden, this was so embarrassing for Sweden. They're a very proud country. Um, this is a very prestigious institution and so many people had been fooled by this man. And they took this very hard and very seriously. And so they reopened the investigation and they, it took them two years and it was just last month that they announced that they're charging him with aggravated assault. So I think they've been very meticulous this time. And this time there will be a trial. And I, I hope he goes to jail. And, and is he know. is he in Sweden facing it? Is he like hiding out in Brazil? Like where the heck is he? I don't know where he is. I mean, the rumor is that he's been in Turkey, um, which makes sense because he has allies in Turkey. Um, I don't know where he is. I don't know if they'll extradite him. Um, on the other hand, the man is so arrogant, as many of these sociopathic con men are. They're such narcissists. Um, he may just show up because he doesn't think he did anything wrong, and he he'll probably. He may show up in court because he thinks he can get away with it. They always think they can get away with it. Wow. So this story's not even done. No. So, and unfortunately, you have some experience with this. What are some of the pink, like, what do you look at? Like, so if somebody's in a relationship, they suspect something's awry. What are some of the things somebody should look out for? Uh, pink flags, red flags. Do you ignore pink flags? Like, walk us through kind of like some sage advice to prevent this from happening to anybody else. You know, in a way they're very simple, but we don't do them um, because we get so caught up in love and, you know, and I always say to women, it's not a crime to fall in love. You know, women blame themselves and my, I'm really on this mission now to s stop this stigma and stop women from feeling like they have to be shamed into silence because they're embarrassed by this. You know, it's not, it's not your fault. You know, these guys are, they're criminals. They're master manipulators. They're predators. They study their prey. They target, I mean, I think back to how vulnerable I was at the time. They tend to target women who are very vulnerable for one reason or another. It could be anything. It could be a death in the family. It could be a job loss. Anything you're going through in your life that makes you vulnerable. So that's one of the first things I tell women is if you're going through something in your life that makes you vulnerable, you have to be hyper vigilant. You have to protect yourself because you're more susceptible to be conned. You're more susceptible to be pulled in by somebody like this because they know how to manipulate you. Another thing is that's a giant red flag is they tend to move very fast. You know, I mean, he was saying, I love you within no time and that he wanted to marry me within no time. And, you know, it takes time to get to know somebody right in a relationship and build a relationship normally. So if they're moving at lightning speed, that's a red flag. Um, they tend to want tons of information from you because they they're they're pulling information because they become exactly what you want. They become your dream man. So to do that, they ask you tons of questions. They, they want to know all kinds of things, but they don't reveal much about themselves. They're very guarded about giving you information. That's a red flag. It's a huge, huge one. Um, and it's a little different for me because it was all the way in Barcelona. Yeah. You have to see where this person lives. You have to see their home surroundings. If someone you are dating will not let you see where they live, there's a reason. They're hiding something, I promise you. you know? um, so that's a giant red flag. Um, and those are just a few of them. And also money. I mean, my guy wasn't after money, but if someone you're just getting to know wants money from you, run, run. You don't, you know, you're not the bank. You don't give a stranger money ever, yeah. ever. You know? well, what's interesting is my experience has been typically the people run the guise of having a lot of money and intermittently offer, it's like a slot machine, offer intermittent reinforcement. Like they'll give you that one trip or they'll give you a, a hotel stay oh, yeah. or go up in exactly. a nice car. So you think, you know, they have money and they come up with some plausible excuse. Oh, this insurance didn't pay this $350,000 surgery. I need 3500 Just You know, they're smart. And then they, they bilk you for it. So yep. those, I, I, agree, I agree with you on that. And it's kind of interesting what they go after, motivations. Um, but some silver lining. So you kind of got your career back on track. I saw, like I saw online and I saw mm -hmm. a documentary. Yep. How did you kind of re-engage your workplace? And, and what are you doing now? So after I made my film, um, I wasn't expecting this actually, but a lot of women started reaching out because it's discovery and it airs all over the world. So a lot of women started reaching out to me from, and not just women, some men too, thanking me, which was very humbling. Wow. But they, they thanked me for being brave enough and courageous enough to sort of air my, you know, open myself up and tell my story. 
And they thanked me for making them feel less stupid and less alone. And I heard from so many people that I realized, wow, there's really a need for us to talk about this and um, to stop women. Like I said earlier, stop women from feeling like they have to hide under the covers and be ashamed and embarrassed because it's not our fault. And I think these con men count on that. If we're quiet and we don't talk, you know, this perpetuates. This is how this continues. They bank on us being too embarrassed to say anything. And that's why this keeps going. So I first made a documentary for um, Oxygen about another one of these guys um, in 2019. And then that's all I do now is I'm, I'm helping other women expose the men who con them. Um, I become a quote unquote love con expert. I'm on Dr. Oz all the time. And I, um, the story was just on ABC. So I have more people reaching out to me and I have something in the works which hasn't been announced yet, but which involves me um, very actively helping other women expose the men who con them. That's awesome. And it just seems like, you know, it probably took a lot of time if we talked to you even Two years ago is probably much different. Um, oh, yeah. It's taken, it's been five years, and I would say it's taken five years when I'm finally back on my feet financially. I, I finally feel like, you know, I'm fully back to myself. Um, it's been hard. It's been a journey. It hasn't been easy um, at all. And God um, bless but, because, yeah, and I'm saying God bless because um, I had traumatic things happen over the last four or five years, uh, and then uh, six years ago. When we lost our mother so so like a lot of bad things happened and and really, at the time it resonated with you said earlier is at the time you didn't know you were vulnerable so like the people right. watching this like sometimes when crappy things are happening like you don't even realize and then afterwards it's like holy shit what just happened exactly so, so you know one of the things that helped me was like you know today's really bad it'll get a little better tomorrow the week after that'll be best the week after that'll be best so kind of to, to wrap things up, what, what's some of your advice somebody who's watching who's maybe struggling um, with something right now, maybe betrayal and the like? First of all, you're stronger than you think and you can get past this. And I, for me personally, I felt very strongly that I did not want to give this man the power of changing me or changing the essence of who I am or making me bitter or angry. Um, because then he wins, you know, he'd already done enough damage. Um, and so I was absolutely determined to still be me. And, you know, I still believe in love. I'm still a hopeless romantic. I have none of that has changed. That's awesome. And talking about it is really important, you know, not feeling so ashamed and not feeling like you have to hide and to know that there are lots and lots and lots of other women out there who are going through the same thing you are and who have experienced the same thing you have. And there's smart, successful, intelligent women. You know, these are not stupid women. This happens to intelligent women all the time. Um, unfortunately, particularly with the prevalence of online dating, this is just proliferating. There's just, they, this is a place, this is a breeding ground for them. They target women and lean on your friends, you know, lean on other people. And I think it helps to watch other stories and see what other women have gone through. Um, I hear that from women all the time. I was just talking to some women last night for a new story I'm working on. And it's just that sense that you're not alone and you're not stupid. This is not your fault. And it's not a crime, again, to fall in love. It's not, that's just not a crime. And it's not a crime to want to trust the person you love. So you didn't do anything wrong. Wow. That's amazing. And, and, and uh, just an amazing person, amazing story. I appreciate you getting back to me and being on the show. Uh, how can we find you, Benita? Um, the best place is on Instagram. It's at lovecond, all one word. So L-O-V-E-C-O-N-N-E-D. Um, yeah, and you can send me a message there and follow my follow everything that's happening now. I have a lot of different things going on. So, um, and I'm just, it's funny. I didn't, I didn't imagine myself on this path, but it somehow makes it all make sense that you know, maybe this was supposed to happen to me because I did have the means as a journalist to expose him and to turn this around into something where I can actually help other people now. So that part of it feels good. Um, yeah, it's nice. And I like that, uh, you know, people say, oh, I don't want this to happen to anybody else, but you actually uh, took the time to do it. So I'll put a link uh, to the ID discovery below. And uh, Anita, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks and, for having me. And, really and for what it's it. worth, you're an inspiration and uh, just, you know, keep being you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure.